In 1912, the unthinkable happened. The unsinkable ship, the Titanic, sank on its maiden voyage nonetheless. And while this is an oft-told story, it's well known, there's a story within the story that is little known. You see, on the ship, there was a passenger. His name was John Harper. He was a Scottish pastor. And as the crew became aware, as that ship hit the iceberg, that the ship was going down and there's not enough boats for everybody on board. Harper went to the upper deck and he began compelling people, come to Jesus. You see, this was a man who was known for his love for God and his love for the lost. And so he ran about the ship saying, come to Jesus, place your faith in Jesus. And he actually led the charge on saying women, children, and those who don't know Jesus into the lifeboats because he knew they needed every opportunity to place their faith in Jesus and repent of their sins. At one point, John finds himself in the frigid waters of the Northern Atlantic. The only thing that's keeping him alive at this moment is the life vest that he has on as he's tossed about the waves. And he, at one point, he comes close to a, another passenger whose name was Steve Crane who's holding on to a hunk of the ship to stay above the icy waters. And John calls out to him, do you believe in Jesus? And Steve says, no, I don't. And the ocean's current pulls John away. And sometime later, he comes back again. And he calls out to Steve again, do you yet believe? And Steve says, I can't say that I do. And then John does the un thinkable. In this weakened state, as his body is going through the stages of hypothermia, he takes off the only thing that is keeping him alive, his life vest. And he hands it to Steve and he says, then you need this more than I do. And there, John Harper's body went below the waves and he died. This man gave his life literally for the loss, just like his savior did. Today, we're going to begin a conversation that Craig started last week. Last week, he talked about loving the unlovables and that we came to the conclusion that all are loved. Today, we're going to hone in on a specific group, though, the lost, those who don't know Jesus. And I have to be honest with you, as I prepared this message, my heart was just ripped out. And I came to a stark reality for myself. I don't love the lost. I don't care. You see, it's so easy for me to be in my my Christian bubble, to have my happy little Sunday service and my community and my life group. and, And I have this circle of Christian friends. All the while, there's a world out there that is perishing And and as I was evaluating this, I realized love is shown by action, not intention. And as I looked at the evidence of my life, there was no action. There's no action of love towards the lost. I intended to, I read it in scripture, and yet it doesn't play out in my life. I don't love the lost. And church, if I can be so bold, family church, we don't love the lost. Now, as I say that, I realize your emotions probably just went everywhere. And what I'm calling us to do today is difficult. Holding up a mirror to our lives is hard. And maybe when you heard me say that, your your initial thought was like mine. When I first felt convicted by God, instead of (laughs) uh, wrestling through it, I said, no, God, here's five reasons why I do love the loss. But then I had to come back to love is action not just intention. So maybe you're like me and you're thinking through justifying. Or, or maybe uh, you're, you're sitting there and you say, yep, just another thing I'm terrible at. I guess you're right. I'm going to have to try a lot harder on this issue. And you're feeling condemnation. I don't want us to be in condemnation or justification. Condemnation, what it tends to do, at least for me, is I get this frenetic burst of energy because I know there's something wrong in me and I need to, I want to change myself. 
And so I try really hard to get into relationship with all these lost people and eventually it pitters out because it's not conviction from God, it's condemnation from the enemy. What I want us to land on today is I want the spirit of God to convict our hearts because conviction can lead to transformation. I want us to have hearts like this man right here, John Harper, who was willing to give his life for the lost. And here's what I'm asking of you. For the next 20 minutes, I'm gonna do everything I can to compel you to join me to make that change, to compel you. This is my confession and repentance moment. I'm gonna do everything I can to compel you to join me and to equip you to do so. But we don't have a lot of time, so let's get to work. The passage we're gonna be in today is John 4. This is one of my favorite stories in all of the Bible. And a little bit of background about this passage. Jesus and his buddies, the disciples, they were baptizing some people. And they actually got so much notoriety that they were baptizing more than John the Baptist. And the Pharisees heard about this. And Pharisees, if you don't know what they are, they were like the religious elites of the day. And they are, you can just think of spiritual killjoys. Anytime Jesus does something awesome, they're like, I don't know about that. Why are you doing that on the Sabbath? They're always so trying to trap him, right? So they hear about this and then Jesus finds out that they know. And he's like, all right, we're bouncing. Judea is where they were. We're gonna go up to Galilee. And it's on this very journey that Jesus has a radical encounter with a lost person and their life changes forever. Starting in verse four, John 4, 4. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sakar, near the plot of ground where Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there and Jesus, tired as he was from his journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. I love this picture of Jesus, right? right. He, he gets to the well and he's like, dude, I'm exhausted. Like, buddy's going to town, give me some food. I need a drink. Where's the bucket? You know, he gets there. He's tired. He's, he's gone about 40 miles at this point. He's beat. And I love this picture of Jesus because we have lots of pictures of Jesus in the Bible uh, where, where you see him in his glory, the transfiguration or his miracles. You see, you see Jesus' divinity. This is one of those moments where you see Jesus' humanity, that he's fully God and fully man. And I love that because I can relate to this, right? I can relate to the exhaustion I see in Jesus. Honestly, the picture though that we, at the, as a church, we often get of Jesus it doesn't look like this guy, right? You look in a kid's Bible and he always just looks like this perfect human being, right? Kind of like a, a male version of Fair Fawcett, right? Like check this out, right? Like the feathered back, blonde hair and the blue eyes and always so composed, right? Never in distress whatsoever, right? Like these are the pictures that we see of Jesus, right? Kind of super spiritual, always got a halo around his head. For some reason, he's always holding his hand like this. And so it, like, but this guy does not look like the guy in this story. This guy looks like when he walks through a dirt road, it parts like the Red Seas because dirt can't touch him, you know? And this guy, he's exhausted. And frankly, this Jesus doesn't look very helpful. He doesn't look like a Jesus who can get down in the grit and the grime and the sin and the brokenness in my life and help me become transformed to his image. So we're gonna marvel at this Jesus in scripture today as he loves a lost person. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. <laughs> Jesus' miracles are often talked about, but nobody talks about the fact that in his 30s, he had 12 close friends. Like, that's amazing. I'm 34. I've got two. All right. Like I need the secrets, Jesus. So he sits down. And he, can I, can I get some water? Verse nine, the Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews don't associate with Samaritans. Now there was a, a deep rooted hatred between Jews and Samaritans. It went back many years, back when the, uh, the kingdom was taken over by pagan nation, the Assyrians. And they brought some of the Jews into exile and they left some of them there. 
And the ones who stayed there kind of intermarried with this pagan people group. And then what they did is they took some of their pagan religion and mixed it with some of the worship of the true God. And they kind of came up with this hybrid deal. And they had their own version of the Torah and their own priesthood and their own place to worship. And so the Jews, when they came back from exile, they began to build the temple again. The Samaritans wanted to help out. And they like, no, you've compromised. You're not following the true God anymore. So there was this deep-rooted hatred between these two people groups. In fact, it was so deep-rooted that the religious elite, this is the pastors of the day, right? The, the religious leaders would tell the people who they had influence over, if you ever see a Samaritan woman in distress in childbirth, don't help her because all you're doing is bringing another Samaritan sinner into the world. Right, this is a deep-rooted hatred. And Jesus, the Jewish rabbi, he communicates with this Samaritan sinner and he breaks all social norms. He just throws that out the window. Jesus answered in verse 10, if you knew the gift of God and who would have asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. I love this. They're having this conversation about a cup of water and Jesus goes deep quick. He's like, let's get into the heart of this issue. You've got issues greater than just this physical need for water. 11, sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father, Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Okay, totally missed the point, right? Jesus is like, we're gonna go from physical conversation down to spiritual. We're going deep, right? I wanna talk about your needs. And this woman's like, where's your bucket, bro? Like, how are you gonna get this water? You say, you, want, you got water to give me. Where, where's your bucket? You gonna climb down the well and get a mouthful? Like, what, baby bird this to me. Like, how are we gonna do this? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So he clarifies, he says, look, you've been coming to this well day after day after day. And every day when you come here at noon alone, you're parched. This doesn't satisfy what I'm talking about does. It's a well of water within your heart, bubbling up, welling up, soaring up to eternal life. The woman said, verse 15, sir, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming back here to draw water. The woman's like, okay, you're talking about a gift of God, living water, eternal life, I'm in, right? Hook, line, and sinker, she's getting baptized next week. Let's do this thing, right? And Jesus does something really interesting here. And frankly, when I first read this, I was shocked. Listen to this. Verse 16, he told her, go, call your husband and come back. What? It's like you're sitting down with somebody at a coffee shop and they're like, yeah, I see that you, you love God and I, I want what you've got. Like sinner on a platter, right? Like they're ready to go, right? And he's like, yeah, but go do this. Verse 17, I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you've had no husband. And the fact is, you've had five husbands. And the man you now have is not your husband. What you've just said is quite true. They're having this conversation. This woman just met Jesus. She has no, we know the whole story because we, we have the Bible. We know the whole context. This woman had no idea who this man was besides that he was a Jewish dude asking for a drink. And now he's telling her all of her dirty laundry. Jesus drops a bomb in this conversation. Yeah, you're right. You've had five husbands and the guy you're shacking up with now, he's not your husband. What you just said is quite true. You see what Jesus is doing, he's going for her heart. Verse 19, sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem, right? Jesus goes for her heart. And what does she do? Pivot. 
Let's talk about theology. We're going to worship over here or over there. Jesus goes for the brokenness in her heart. And she's like, well, you're not getting through here. Let's talk about religious practices. I don't want you to talk about what's going on in here. Verse 21, woman, Jesus replied. Now, when Jesus calls, there's a couple times in the New Testament where Jesus calls somebody woman, a woman, woman. And in this time, it was not a demeaning or belittling thing. That does not mean husbands to go home and call your wife woman. You will be slapped, okay? Um, but, but this was not a belittling thing. He says, woman, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you don't know. We worship what we do, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. What I love about this is this woman puts up a wall and Jesus says, I'm not giving up on you, right? She, she puts up this wall and Jesus continues to go for her heart. He says, it's not about religious practices and which location is best. He says, God wants authentic worship from your heart. He wants your heart. He wants you to worship him in spirit and in truth. And I think at this point, this woman, based on her next statement, must have thought, what is going on with this guy? This conversation began with a drink of water, and now he's telling me we don't know what we're doing with our worship and that God wants authentic spiritual worshipers. Maybe he doesn't know what he's talking about. Verse 25, the woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. I think she was thinking, like, we're so far off right here. Like, this we don't know what we're talking about. We'll just wait for the Messiah to come. And I love this next line, verse 26. Then Jesus declared, then Jesus declared all through this passage. It says, then Jesus said, Jesus said, Jesus replied, Jesus answered. And now it's Jesus declared, right? This is emphatic. Like the mountains must have shook in this moment. Jesus declared. And what does he declare? I, the one speaking to you, I am he. What I love about this is this is the first time in the book of John where Jesus reveals his true identity to anybody. And it's to a harlot, heretical, half-breed Samaritan woman, an outcast of the outcasts. Jesus reveals who he truly is to her. Jesus loves lost people. There's a few things that I really want us to take from this passage. Remember at the beginning, I said, I want to compel you and equip you. We're going to look at what Jesus does and then put that into practice. The first thing I want you to see is Jesus sought the lost. Let's look at it again in the passage. Jesus sought the lost. Now he had to go through Samaria. Now he had to. Well, why is that significant? Because he didn't have to. You see, the, because of this deep-rooted hatred between Jews and Samaritans, their Jewish people would avoid Samaria at all cost. They would take an extra three days journey around it so that they didn't have to come in contact with these sinners. It was almost as if they viewed their specific brand of sin as contagious. And so they would, they, they would take, I know this is small, but they would take this, this journey up around the dotted line there and to avoid these people no matter what. That was the traditional route of a Jewish person. Look at where Jesus goes. He's the green arrow there. He goes right into the heartland of the outcasts so that he can come into the hearts of the outcasts. Jesus sought the lost in Luke 19, he sums up his mission on this earth this way. For the Son of Man came to what? Seek and save the lost. He came to seek and save the lost, to pursue and rescue. That's his mission. Let me ask you, is this your mission? Have you joined Jesus in this? 
I think everybody here would agree that the church's mission is to join Jesus in what he's doing. Seeking and saving the lost. People helping people find and follow Jesus. Specifically for what we're talking about today. People helping lost people find and follow Jesus. But I think where we get it twisted is when we take ourselves and make the church separate from us. I think often we think of the church as a building, a location, a service, a program, the pastors, the staff. But that's not what this says. Scripture talks about us as the church. You are the church. I am the church. We are the church. So is this your mission? Is this your personal mission? This is the mission of Jesus in the world. If the mission you're on ends with you, it's not God's mission. It goes beyond you and you play a vital role. Jesus wants to use you in your spheres of influence. If the mission you're on ends with you, it is not God's mission. Several weeks ago, I was sitting down with a lost friend at a restaurant and uh, it's very apparent that this person is lost. From their outward appearance, it's very not the norm. Um, Their language leaves something to to be desired. Uh, They speak in vulgarities and innuendos and cuss words, and and they have no volume control. And so I'm sitting here at dinner with this person, and um, I'm wearing a family church t-shirt. And there were tables all around us. And I'd love to tell you that I was there on mission, just loving the lost, just like I see Jesus doing in this passage. But there was a table to my left and they kept looking over at me. At one point I met eyes with them and they looked down at my t-shirt. Everybody in the restaurant can hear my friend. And what was going on in my head was not, man, I'm loving this person. I, I wanna draw out their heart. I want them to know Jesus. It was, I wonder what they're thinking about me. I wonder what this table to my left is thinking about me. It was, it was, I wonder if this is going to hurt my reputation. I'm a pastor. I work at a church. I was so focused on my pride that I was distracted from the mission right in front of me. Pride inhibits mission. If we're ever going to reach the lost, we're going to have to be okay laying down our reputation, laying down our pride. What did they call Jesus? A glutton and a drunkard. Not because that was true, but because he hung out with sinners and tax collectors. And when you hang out with sinners and tax collectors, your reputation suffers. Are you willing to let down your pride so that you can get on the greatest mission in the world. Is this your mission and is your pride in the way of it? The next thing I want you to see is that Jesus transcends labels. He transcends labels. This woman places labels on both of them. Look at it in the text. When the Samaritan woman came to draw water, she said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. When the Samaritan, woman said, the Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? What is she? She places labels. Look at these labels. You're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan woman. Now, these labels are true, right? But they're divisive. They separate. She said, what she's saying here is because of the labels on our lives, we're not supposed to associate. They're true, but they're divisive. And she places these labels on each other. And this woman could have a whole lot more labels on her, right? We know that she's been divorced five times, that she's an outcast from her society because she's at this well at noon. You don't go to the well at noon. You go in the cool of morning or the cool of the evening. She's there because she's been shamed probably by her society. This is a woman who's had plenty of labels placed on her life. And here Jesus is engaging with her. It was unthinkable for a woman to talk to a man in public that wasn't her relative, 
let alone for a woman to talk to a rabbi, a teacher. And Jesus doesn't care. He throws away all those social norms. He says the primary label, the primary identity of this woman is not Samaritan, is not sinner. The primary label that I see is image bearer of the king. And I'm here to redeem her. Jesus looked past all those labels to her heart. When I was 19 years old, I had lots of labels on me. Some of them I placed on myself. Some of them societies placed on me. And some of them others placed on me. They were things like liar, failure, drug addict, felon, womanizer. And I lived at a, a shelter. It was called uh, Casa de Berlin. At the time, it was a homeless shelter for teens. It's, it's transitioned its, its mission since then. But at the time, it was a rough crowd there. You're talking people who had been out of prison, people who... Uh, that had homeless teens that were um, drug addicted or they just in and out of juvie or jail and alcoholics. I mean, you name it, it was there. We had police coming in, searching the place for drugs with, uh, with dogs and all kinds of stuff. This was a rough crowd. I remember back then always feeling the weight of those labels. This is just who I am now. At the beginning of my adulthood, this is who I am now. But there was one day a week where I didn't feel those labels. Where instead of my identity being a felon, I got to be Jason. There was a couple um, who would come there regularly. And every time they came around, it was like grandma and grandpa were there, right? You're like, what did they bring? What what are they gonna do? Sometimes he'd bring his motorcycle and take us kids on rides. Or sometimes they'd bring some food and, and share some treats with us. Or sometimes they'd just come to sit down and have a meal with us. And it was like every time they were there, the labels melted away and they saw you. And and, and I felt loved despite all the labels I had on my life. A couple's name was Joe and Ricky Lawrence. And you may know them. Joe was our county commissioner. They were well off. They were kind of a high profile family. And, And they had nothing to gain by hanging out with us. There were no votes to gain there. We're all felons. But they chose to stay committed to us. And I tell you, I never felt so loved during that time at a homeless shelter as I did when they came. Other people, you could tell they were there for ulterior motives. Joe and Ricky were there because they loved us. So what labels do you struggle with? with? What labels do you struggle with? Often labels are polarizing, right? You're over here, I'm over here. That's the opposite of Jesus' mission. Labels polarize, but Jesus pursues. And I think there's one label that the church really struggles to love. And the tough thing is that I know, speaking into this, some of you in the room are going to misunderstand me. That label is LGBTQ. This is a transgender woman named Caitlyn Jenner. Church, we don't know how to love people that identify this way. We don't know how to love them. And I realize, I want to just pause, I realize for some of us in the room, This is happening in our very own homes. It's one thing to say we need to love a person we're never going to meet. But for some of us, this is happening in our own homes. There there are our our kids and our grandchildren are wrestling through, am I transgender? Am I gay? Am I bisexual? And I know and I understand that that can be a very tearing thing. And while I want to be gracious to that, I also want to call us to love. Like the mission of God doesn't end with this person. It it doesn't stop because of their specific sin. And I'm not not saying I condone the lifestyle. What I'm saying is that, that they need Christ. And I think we've placed this label on them that they are unsavable. 
That's just simply not true. Jesus in this passage, he brings about this woman's brokenness. He doesn't mince meat about it. He doesn't say, oh, it's okay, honey. Don't worry about that sin. He brings it to the surface. And what does he do? He still offers her living water. Church, if, if we're ever going to affect change in the future generations, we're going to have to be okay transcending the labels and saying, I'm here for your heart because you are an image bearer regardless of the image you present. We have to transcend the label, even if it's one they put on themselves. The next thing I want to just look at that Jesus does with this woman. Jesus drew out brokenness. Jesus drew out her brokenness. Let's look at it again in the passage. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Now, this is an amazing moment for this woman. We know, uh, most likely scholars will say that in first century Palestinian culture, a woman could not initiate divorce. So five times a man has chosen to leave her. And we don't know why. We do know that there's some, some validity to the idea that you could get divorced because of adultery. But we don't know the specifics of her divorces. We just know she's been left five times, desolate. In this culture, for you to be unmarried, you're like a second-class citizen. And now she's shacking up with somebody else. And she's been living in shame. She's used to men taking what they need from her and leaving her. And here is Jesus, the God man saying, I don't want to take anything. I've got a gift for you. I want to give you eternal life. I want to give you living water. God has a gift for you. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. And then Jesus does that very interesting thing. He told her, go, call your husband, come back. I wonder at this moment in the conversation, I wonder if she was able to keep eye contact with Jesus. The text doesn't say this, but I can just imagine her. At this point, Jesus is hitting on some shame. And I wonder if at this point is when her eyes cast to the ground and her skin turns red with shame. Shame just washes over her as Jesus begins to bring some of that brokenness and wounding to the surface. And she says, I have no husband. And Jesus, he doesn't stop there though. He wants to get to the heart of the issue. Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you've had five husbands, and the the man you now have is not your husband. What you've just said is quite true. You see, she told him, I have no husband. He says, yes, but there's a deeper problem. You're looking for relationships to quench your spiritual thirst. I've got something that can really quench it. He draws out her brokenness, not so she can experience shame but so that she can receive grace. Grace comes in through our brokenness, our wounding, and our sin. That's where grace is most powerful and profound. And he he draws it out of her so that she can receive grace. If we're ever going to win lost people to Christ, we're going to have to be okay getting in the dirt with them listening to the brokenness in their lives, being okay, talking about their sin, drawing out their heart. You know, I used to think about discipleship or evangelism as as kind of, you know, this gospel presentation and then you need to repent and respond. I don't know about you, but that doesn't work very well for me. I haven't had great success with that. And I see Jesus building relationship with people as a bridge for the gospel. What if we could do that? What if instead of uh, sitting down for an hour at a coffee shop, what if we invited the lost into our life? Just unabashed, you're coming in. You're gonna hang out with my family, my friends. You're gonna be in my circle of influence. I love you as you are, not as you ought to be. What if we could draw out their heart, draw out the brokenness? What if we could draw out what they're looking to for salvation? 
if we can answer those questions with them, we can make the gospel truly beautiful to them because they'll see how the good news meets them where they're at, not where they ought to be. Jesus draws out this woman's brokenness so that she can receive living water, eternal life, a gift of grace from God. And I love this. Her, she, her response to him knowing her whole sordid history. Sir, the woman said, I can perceive that you're a prophet. Like instantly, like, whoa. You, how, did you, how did you know that? Jesus instantaneously builds trust and relationship with this woman because he knows all things. You see, he uses a tool that we don't have at our disposal. But we're still called to build relationship. And although we don't know all things, we do have a tool at our disposal to build relationship. T I M E. Time. It takes time. You have to be willing to get in the trenches with people. And frankly, it takes a lot more time with people outside the church people who don't want to come into the church because the, the resounding voice that they've heard is the church is irrelevant. Why do I need your God? They need to see you in active relationship with Jesus and they need you to take the time to show them how that can mean something to them. Frankly, it takes a lot more time than we're willing to give. This is not just going through a book for six months. This takes years sometimes. And God can do amazing things. It can happen like that. But often, it takes time. That's the greatest resource you have. And in the crazy busy world we live in, it's so limited. Are you going to use your time to invest in the mission of God? And I think Jesus in this moment is bringing about this woman's brokenness. Not to shame her, but because... Love is most profound when we are fully known and still fully loved. You see, I think what we often tell ourselves is, if you really knew what's going on in here and here, you would reject me. There is no way you would, you would hate me. You wouldn't love me. You'd be scared of me. And here's Jesus who knows all things. He's pursuing this woman fully known and yet still fully loved. Fully known and still fully loved. I think we often say, if you knew what I was hiding, there's no chance we'd have a relationship. There's a world out there that needs us to do this. That needs us to say, look, let's talk about this. Tell me about your history. Tell me your wounds. Tell me the brokenness in your life. I'm going to love you in it. That's what Jesus does for this woman. And there's a crazy ending to this story because of it. The disciples come back and they see Jesus talking to this Samaritan woman and they're like, whoa, bro, what's going on here? Why are you talking to her? And, and she leaves her jar, runs to the town and says, Look, you got to come see this guy. He told me everything I've ever done, right? This is the same town that shamed her. He told me everything I've ever done. You need to come see him. It could be the Christ. And look at this, the ending of this story. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. She, she helps so many in that town come to their faith. And then they actually ask Jesus to stay there with them. And many more come to faith. This is the story of the gospel. This is the story of the disciples who Jesus said, hey, sinner, hey, tax collector, come follow me. I'm gonna change your life and give you a mission. This is a story of Paul the apostle, a religious man who was totally lost. And Jesus said, I'm gonna open your eyes and you're gonna do great things for the Gentiles. This is my story. And an addict it was broken that God ripped me out of the heart of addiction and said, I got a better thing for your life. And this is your story. You see, the only difference between us and the lost is grace. That's it. We're all lost apart from grace. So will you join me 
At the beginning of this, I talked about compelling you and equipping you. And as we've looked at our Savior, here's what he did. He sought the lost, he transcended labels, and he drew out brokenness. Will you join me on this mission? The story I told at the beginning of John Harper. We know that that story is true because the guy actually survived that he was talking to. Four years after the Titanic ended, or uh, the tragedy on the Titanic happened, there was a ceremony where they remembered those who lost their lives. And that man showed up there. And he told the story of what John did for him. And at the end of it, he said, I am the last convert of John Harper. I'm the last person this man helped to come know Jesus. Don't you want a story like that? I know I do. I'm going to release to the campuses. I love you guys. 